I am currently in the process of migrating the breadboards of my homebrew CPU over to proper PCBs. I already have the register stack all set up and working. It consists of seven registers, has a bunch of LEDs at the top that show the data that goes in and out of the registers, and I have a move and immediate buffer at the bottom that allows me to move data between registers and load immediates, and it also contains a flags register for the ALU. Moving all of this on proper PCBs has made the build quite a bit cleaner. Today I want to continue this work and create a PCB for the program memory. This program memory PCB will just contain the program flash chip and it will sit on the second backplane here on the right, just below the program counter. I'm planning to use one of these Zero Insertion Force sockets to hold the flash memory because that will make it easy to swap the memory in and out of the build without putting too much stress on the pins of the chip. So let's jump right in and draw up a schematic for this PCB. To get started, let me add the flash chip, which is the reason we're building this PCB in the first place. We'll want some labels on the address pins. And since we're currently working with just 16-bit addresses, I'm going to tie the upper address pins low. We'll also never want to write to this memory. And we always want to have the chip enabled and also the output from the chip enabled. And finally, we'll want some labels on the data outputs. In order to read 16 bits from this 8-bit memory, we also need that latch to perform the double pumping. This was a 74HC573 on the breadboard, and I'm going to use one of the narrow 5.3 millimeter wide variants. On the input side, we'll connect the data coming out of the ROM. The latch enable will connect to the clock. This now means that when the clock is high, the latch is transparent, and when the clock goes low, the latch will remember uh, its previous input. To do the double pumping, we need to connect address bit 0 of the flash to the clock, such that while the clock is high, we're reading out the upper byte, and then when the clock goes low, we're reading out the lower byte from the flash. This now means that while the clock is high, the latch is seeing the upper byte, and as soon as the clock transitions to low, the latch will store the upper byte, and the flash memory will then start to output the lower byte. So the thing coming out of the latch chip is the upper byte of what we're reading. Now, one of the things that has actually annoyed me on the breadboard is that you can see this intermediate state while the clock is high, where the latch is producing the exact same value as the flash chip. And so this bogus instruction shows up where the upper and lower 8 bits are identical. But I think what we can do, since this latch has an output enable, is we can decide to just not produce any output while the clock is high such that in the first half of the clock cycle, we see no data, and in the second half of the clock cycle, we see the data that is actually correct. So we'll also want the ability to not output the lower byte. To do that, let me copy this latch chip, and let me use it for the lower byte as well. And we don't need the latching functionality here, this latch is just an output buffer, so let me tie the latch enable high, such that it is continuously transparent. And by connecting the active flow output enables to the clock, we won't see any output during the high phase of the clock, but only see output during the low phase. This will work as it is, but I think we'll want to have the ability to also have an output enable input to the entire PCB, such that the backplane can control whether the program ROM PCB should produce any output or not. Because in the future, when we have regular SRAM memories as well, uh, we want to have the backplane decide whether the SRAMs or the program memory is being accessed and which one should produce data. So it's handy to have such an input available. But that means we can't just connect the clock directly to the latches, but we have to um, combine the clock and this output enable condition from the outside uh, to produce this enable signal. Let me use an OR gate to do this. The 74HC1G32 is a convenient single gate version of the OR gates we've already been using in the build. And this OR gate will produce a 1 at its output when either the clock is high or the output enable is high. And if we make the output enable active low, as they usually are, this will only enable the latches when both the clock is low and the output enable input is low. Let me add a green LED to show the status of this um, output enable line. And I think we'll also want to be able to look at the data port. I think 16 blue LEDs will do the trick. Then we'll want headers for the address and data. and also for powering ground, the clock, and the output enable. 
and we'll also want the usual bigger capacitor close to the power header and four 100 nanofarad capacitors since we have four chips. That looks pretty good. I think that's all we had on the breadboard plus a little bit of extra new functionality. Let's move over to the layout editor. Let me use the program counter PCB as a reference for where the headers might want to go. I think we'll want the address input on the right, where it's easy to connect to the program counter, and then the data output on the left. Power and ground can also line up. And then let me get rid of the program counter stuff again. And then let me roughly arrange the components. And the box around the flash memory is kind of the worst case outline that the SIF socket will have. So I'll make sure that I don't place any components in that box. To get started, let me figure out the routing of the address lines from the header to the flash memory, because this looks like it might be a squeeze. Then we'll need to wire up the LEDs and the data port. Then we'll want to bring the data that comes out of the flash memory over to the latches. And then let me place the OR gate somewhere and wire it up. And then let me finish up the remaining connections. Then let me add the usual logos. And finally, let me pour some copper. VDD on the top layer and ground on the bottom layer. Let's take a quick look at the 3D preview. That's going to be a pretty handy and cool little PCB. Let me order this up from the manufacturer and then let's go assemble it. I just received the stencil and the PCBs in the mail. Let me go and apply solder paste to one of the PCBs. And then let's add the components, starting with the smallest. First up, we have a 10 microfarad capacitor. Then we have a bunch of 100 nanofarad capacitors for each of the chips. Then we have a resistor for the output enable LED and the output enable LED itself. Then we have a bunch of resistors for the data LEDs and the memory data LEDs themselves. Then we have a 74HC1G32 chip. And finally, let me add the two 74HC573 latch chips. And then let's solder this up. And then let me add the pin headers.
And then finally, as the last step, we need to solder on this uh, zero insertion force socket. This is going to be a bit annoying because the uh, pins have a tendency to be bent. All right, there we go, pretty cool. Let me give this a quick cleanup off camera and then let's go and test it. All right, I've gotten the CPU build back out. And now let's try to get this new PCB into the build. To make it easier to connect to the pins of the PCB, let me mount it on the breadboard just temporarily. And then let me connect these wires, which connect to various pieces of the instruction, to the data output of the PCB. Let's start at the top with the immediate bits. That also includes the opcode for the ALU for now, until we have proper instruction decoding. And then we have the RS register operand and the RD register operand. Then we've been feeding the write enable for the register from bit number seven of the instruction. Then we have the immediate bit and the bit that selects between a move or the result of the ALU. And then finally, the lowest two bits just select the program counter mode. That's all the data connections moved over. And now the only thing left to do is to take the current program counter value and use it as an address into the program ROM. Then let me hook up power and ground. And I'm gonna constantly enable the output of the ROM for now. And we need a clock. And in theory, this should already work. I've gone ahead and created a copy of the program that is currently on the program memory here in the build and put it onto a new flash chip, which is absolutely identical to the other one. So let me put that into the socket. And then for an initial test, let me connect the address inputs of the old program memory uh, to the new one. And this will allow us to observe whether both produce the same values, which is what we would expect. All right, let me power this up and then let's see if things work. That looks pretty promising, but we also need a clock signal and a reset. Uh, so let me bring the clock generator back in. Let me step it out of reset. And then we're at the beginning of the program. This is still the conditional move program, which computes um, the largest Fibonacci number that fits into 16 bits. Let me step through a few instructions. First, we're gonna clear the register file. That looks promising. Then we're loading 1001 into the first register and we're using flag swap to store this into the flags register. Then we're loading a one into the first register and then we're conditionally moving that one into other registers uh, depending on whether the flags are set. So this sets the registers to carry, not carry, zero and not zero. Then we're clearing this back up and we're doing the same for sign, not sign, overflow and not overflow. And then we're clearing this up again. Pretty nice, nothing obvious is broken at first glance. Let me hit run, and we should see the processor compute the largest 16-bit Fibonacci number and then halt. And this is still the number 46,368, the largest 16-bit Fibonacci number. That's pretty exciting. Looks like the new program ROM PCB is working. So I think what we can do now is actually rip out the old program ROM here and replace it with the new one and this should get rid of quite a bit of this wiring. All right, that cleans up pretty nicely. And on this breadboard here, we have just this random inverter chip left. And once we do proper instruction decoding, that chip will also disappear. Let me power this up one more time and see if it still works. That still looks good. New feature of this PCB is that the data output will actually be zero while the clock is high, because that's when we only have read out the first half of the bits from the ROM, and so the data output is basically just garbage. This now prevents the CPU from just flashing random control lines because of the garbage output in the first half of the clock cycle. So when I hold the clock in the high state, you can see that most of the control lines of the CPU actually turn off. That still looks promising. Let's clear the register file. And then there's an immediate load and a flag swap. All right, that still works. Let me hit run and let's see if this still computes the largest Fibonacci number in 16 bits. 
pretty neat. That is still the number 46,368, but now with the old program ROM all removed. Pretty cool. This all seems to work. We've gotten rid of the old breadboard version of the program ROM and we have this new nice PCB available. And then in terms of things we need for the pipeline backplane, we have the program ROM PCB, we have the program counter PCB, and all that's left to do is to um, take this ALU and move that onto a PCB as well. And then we can arrange all of this nicely on a small little backplane for the pipeline. And this will free up a lot of space and get rid of almost all of the remaining uh, breadboards. And this will allow me to finally get going with instruction decoding and looking into more advanced concepts of how you control a pipeline of a CPU. Really excited to get to work on that. Like and subscribe if you want to see more of this and see you next time.